Hello friends. Uh, this is Monday morning and we are uh, giving an update on our uh, Sunday school lesson, our latest class. We do this because we know that with uh, the COVID restrictions, there are still some that are unable to come. Uh, and we want you to know that as a church, we love you and we want to stay connected with you. We want you to be involved with every aspect of our ministry here, even though we may be going about it in different methods and means, the love that we have for you remains the same. Uh, and so we appreciate that you're able to join us. Uh, we offer a number of different Sunday school lessons and styles for you to be able to stay with, as well as the two services that pastor preaches and our Wednesday night service. So if there is anything that we can do for you, we are only a phone call away. So we want you to know that we are uh, here and that we are uh, engaging in all of this for it to be an uplifting part of service for you. Our Sunday school lesson this morning is in the last part of John. Now following uh, next week, which we're going to beginning, be, just begin the Acts chapter 2, which will be Pentecost, with this period of time, we know that there was 40 days between Jesus' resurrection and the time of his ascension, but some things were happening and we don't want to overlook any part of this because all of this is vital for us to learn from. So if you look at John chapter 20 uh, and verse uh, 19, uh, on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And Jesus again says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. So I want you to see with this that whenever Christ comes, he gives them the first words are, Peace be with you. Uh, he had said those words to them over and over earlier in the book of John. Whenever he said, my peace I leave with you, let not your hearts be troubled. I'm going to prepare a place for you. He had often talked of them being aware that he was able to give them peace, that it was going to be an important part for them to continue the ministry. And he also says to them that he shows them his hands and his side. For them to show his side, it must have been a large wound that had been there. And you know, that is where the Roman soldiers had pierced uh, the lower part of his side and there was water and blood that gushed out. So it was a large indention that was placed there. But he says, look at my hands and my feet. And then he says, my peace that I give to you. And then by giving them the Holy Spirit that he breathed on them, he is signifying that even in the smallest details, when we are in God's will, we need God's power for it to accomplish God's purposes. And even though it was only for a short period of time, they were not to depend upon themselves. All of this was going to be important, and the Holy Spirit was going to come on them, and then later with the others that were in the upper room with them. So then we have following that in verse 24. Now Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, but he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. And a week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now I want you to see just with Thomas once more that Thomas is, uh, we find the last time that we find any conversation with Thomas, it's in Genesis, I mean in uh, the book of John, uh, John chapter 14. And in John chapter 14 and verse uh, 5, Thomas says to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answers Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Uh, and so that is a conversation that is given so that we can see what Thomas's personality was like. But after the crucifixion and death of Christ, apparently Thomas 
reverts to that cynical uh, attitude of he does not know where Jesus is. He does not know how to follow. Perhaps he was being absolutely transparent whenever he told the Lord, but he wasn't listening to what the Lord's answers were. And here we find that the disciples, when they see Thomas, they tell him their experience. They said, we've seen the Lord. Uh, we've seen his hands. We've been seen his feet. But they uh, did not tell him perhaps what the Lord had said. And the Lord had said to them, peace be with you. Uh, and so we have to be remindful of ourselves that it is wonderful to share our experience of what God has done but nothing can substitute for what the Word of God is that speaks to our heart, and it's the Word that brings life. Uh, and here, a week later, so the following Sabbath, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and made himself visible among them, and he says, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, Thomas. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe me. Now, I want you to know that here, that whenever Thomas had spoken with the disciples, Thomas had used a phrase and he said, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Do you know at this point, this is the only place that I can find in any of the gospels that tells you specifically that nails were used in Jesus' hands and in his feet because with crucifixions in this part of the Roman times, sometimes they were bound with ropes. And whenever they're giving those, um, when they're recalling the crucifixion with the gospels, they do not say the nails, the nails, but by Thomas expressing uh, this doubt, we know that there were actual nails that helped Jesus to the cross. Uh, and so he says here to Thomas, he says, um, he repeats exactly in answering Thomas for uh, the, ans the questions that Thomas had vocalized. He said, put your finger here and see into my hands and put your hand into my side. And then he says, stop doubting and believe. And Thomas's response is, my Lord and my God. Uh, so Thomas uh, does bow before him. And the Lord says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Um, and you find almost the exact same words whenever you read uh, the first book of Peter about those who believe having not seen and they are granted uh, their salvation because of their faith in the Lord Jesus. And so we find here also that Jesus is saying to Thomas, uh, he just says, uh, uh, his Thomas's problem was uh, he had doubt and he did not believe what God had told him before. But notice that he does not make any shame for Thomas. God addresses what the real problem is in our life, but he does not use guilt or shame to correct us. And that is important to know because many uh, times in this period of time, we're going to see where these apostles, these disciples, early disciples do make errors. But whenever they are corrected, that's what it is, a correction for their behavior or for their attitude, for their thinking. But God does not uh, uh, make them feel guilty or, sh or to shame them in any way like that. Now, the other person that I can find that has similar circumstances with this is if you look back at the book of uh, ju Judges. If you go back to Judges chapter 6, verse 34, it won't take long, but it's a great illustration of exactly what Thomas had. If you go back to the Judges chapter 6, verse 34, and you find that this is, in our Bible, it tells us that Gideon, uh, this is the... Uh, whenever he is helping the Israelites to defeat the Midianites. Now, in the book of Judges, chapter 6, you find that Israel was under intense oppression, that there, was, uh, there were so many armies that they were like swarms of bees that would come into all of Israel. They did not, with, with all of their um, camels, they set up tents. They took every bit of food. They took every animal. And whenever they left, they had dissipated all of the land of Israel, and there was nothing left for them. And the Lord himself comes to Gideon, 
as the angel of the Lord. And we know that from there, uh, Gideon is given instructions of what he's going to do. And Gideon also uh, prepares a young goat and flour, and he puts this meat and basket uh, on this. He makes this altar uh, on the unleavened bread, and he pours this broth over the unleavened bread and the, um, the meat. And whenever the tip of the staff of this angel of the Lord touched that, all of this uh, sacrifice went up in smoke, including including the angel of the Lord. So uh, Gideon has already been given a commission. He knows what he's supposed to do. He believes that God is going to do that, uh, and he doesn't have any problems with that. But if you go over to the verse uh, 34, uh, and I, I will tell you, let's start at 33, just so you can see the picture of it. Now, uh, all the Midianites and the Amalekites and all other eastern people had joined forces and crossed over the Jordan and camped in the valley of Jezreel. And then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. Uh, and so he is calling all of his messengers from all of these different tribes to come and help him. And then in 36, he says to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have promised, I have a wool fleece here. And you know with that fleece, he had had once of those where he laid the fleece out. If the ground around it was wet and the fleece was dry, he would know that this was God's affirmation. And then if another part, if the fleece was wet, but the ground around it was dry, that would be affirmation. And so I want you to see that this is not when they are deciding their salvation. And both of these men, both Thomas and uh, Gideon had been given a commission to do, but what they were asking God in both places to do was confirmation. Uh, Thomas had asked for confirmation of the Lord by seeing the prince in his hands and his side, and uh, Gideon was also asking uh, for confirmation that God was going to use him to deliver the children of Israel. And what's more, God does not use shame, even with Gideon. He gives him, uh, he answers exactly what Gideon had wanted to know to affirm to him that if he followed, he was, being, he was going to uh, have everything accomplished as God had told him. And the third time, actually, God comes to him and he says to him, uh, during the night, the Lord said to Gideon, get up and go down against the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. But if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant and listen to what they were saying. And afterwards, you will be encouraged to attack the camp. So I want you to know with Thomas, that that is exactly what God did. He, the Lord Jesus, gave him confirmation uh, that all of the things that he had said were going to be carried out by the power of the Lord Himself. Uh, but he did not. Uh, he did not uh, shame him or guilt, give him any guilt. He just gave him correction, and that's what the Lord does with us. So the other thing that I want to go over is uh, with us. We know that we are going to, as Gentiles, we've gone over this often, often in Genesis chapter 4, that uh, as the church, the mystery of the church was revealed to Paul the apostle in a revelation after the ascension of the Lord Jesus and after Pentecost. And though this had always been the plan of God, it was not made known uh, until Paul the apostle preached that and gave full understanding of what this period of time, this, uh, this administration was going to be different. And that period of time of administration is often called a dispensation. Now, there is always a dispensation of grace that the entire earth has not been destroyed is always God's grace. But it was going to be a different way of God using the Holy Spirit and gathering up a brand new group of believers. And this group of believers would be uh, a, a group that would combine Gentiles with the Jews and they would all be equal in this new organism called the church, which no one had known before. It had been in initiated, it had sort of been uh, given a little illustrations occasionally, but no one fully understood until Paul. But if you read Galatians 4, chapter 4, when the time had fully come, 
God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of uh, under this law. Uh, and to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons now, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts and the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, for you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. So, uh, though I apologize, I, did, I didn't read that as well as I had hoped. My point in saying this is, and this dispensation of grace, God deals differently with these Gentiles and with the Hebrews in that he says we are all one through the blood of Christ and that this was revealed in this specific time to accomplish his purposes. But it is a marvelous, wonderful uh, work of God's grace upon the earth. And that is that these people that are Gentiles uh, are from all languages, from all nations, from all kingdoms are going to be composed into uh, one with the Jews and all of us under the headship of the Lord Jesus. Now, with this, we want to see that um, um, speaking of that we are now the sons of God through this grace, we're going to find that in Matthew chapter 17, verse 24 through 27, there is a story that God, uh, that the Lord Jesus tells whenever uh, the, the men from the synagogue came and they were speaking to Peter and to Jesus. And they say, to Peter, doesn't your master uh, observe the, the shekel for the synagogue? Doesn't he observe the tax th that he's supposed to pay? And so Peter goes to the Lord Jesus and he says to him, uh, the men from the temple are here and they want to know about our taxes. And so Jesus uses this opportunity to just say something to Peter. In uh, 17, he says, um, let's see, 24 through 27, uh, he says, Peter, Whenever, uh, whenever there, the, there is a king, who pays taxes whenever there is a kingdom? Does uh, the king, and the answer is no, the king. And he says, does the king's son, do the, do the heirs pay taxes? And Peter said, no. And so uh, the Lord is showing that in this new kingdom, um, there, there are going to be different regulations and different laws. But he said, and just to make sure that uh, we observe this, go and cast your um, a line into the sea and pull out the first fish, open his mouth, and you'll find a gold coin and give that to these men who here who are here for their taxes. Give them their tax money. Now, one of the things that that is called is that it's the shekel of the synagogue, and it is a requirement in the Old Testament that the firstborn of every family had to give a specific amount to the Levites. And that's because God had said he had redeemed all of the firstborn from uh, the land of Egypt. And you find that in uh, Exodus chapter 13 and verse 13. And so it was a payment that was to be made to the temple for every firstborn son, firstborn son. But you also find that reemphasized in Exodus chapter 30 and verse 11. And in Exodus chapter 30, verse 11, uh, he gives even more uh, information uh, there. And it says uh, in 30, 30, 13, uh, I'll just start here. Uh, Each one who crosses over to those already counted is to give half a shekel according to the sanctuary, according to the sanctuary shekel, which weighs 20 garas. This half shekel is an offering to the Lord, and all who cross over uh, those 20 years or more are to give an offering to the Lord. The rich are not to give more than a half shekel, and the poor are not to give less. When you are making an offering to the Lord for the atonement of your lives, receive the atonement money from the Israelites and use it for the service of the tent of meetings it will be a memorial for the Israelites before the Lord. That was what was required for every one of the firstborn. We are, as uh, we read in Galatians chapter 4, 
we are now the children of God, and we know that as being children, he doesn't uh, divide us as being men or women or Gentiles or Hebrews. We are all one. And if you look at Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 23, it actually says in Hebrews 12, 23, that we are the firstborn and our names are written in heaven. Uh, and that word uh, uh, firstborn is also a word that is uh, plural, uh, a plural word, and I will just read that to you. And um, you have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men. And so the church of the firstborn, that is a plural word, and the tenses following that, whose names are written in heaven, indicates that that is more than just the Lord Jesus, though sometimes he is referred to as the firstborn. Here, it's it's including a larger number of people. And so my whole point of saying that is, uh, we are the firstborn, the firstborn uh, of God. Children of God do not have a second, um, are not of lesser value as you go down. All of God's children are equally important. There is no descending order of pecking order with the children of God. And that is why whenever he gives these instructions, the rich could not give more, the poor could not give less, because this was to show that there was no distinction whenever you are in uh, God's family. He has a specific plan, a specific purpose, uh, and you are always dear and beloved of him. Uh, and so we have that, uh, we are also receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and we are to be thankful and worship God ex uh, acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. And so he deals with us as he deals with children. He corrects us whenever he needs to. He gives us insights. He gives us truths. Uh, and then uh, he helps us to accomplish his will and his purpose for us for this time. So I think I have that. And then the last to show what does God do so that our um, we don't pay shekels and we don't have to. And you find the answer to that. Uh, to what does God use? God made the payment himself for all of the firstborn in his family. And you find that in uh, the book of First Peter chapter 1. Uh, and I'll just start with verse 17. First Peter chapter 1 verse 17 through 20. Therefore, since you are called on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear, for you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Uh, and so we are, uh, we are born again, not of a perishable seed, but of an imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Um, the last part that I want to make with this that we have is that we have uh, the promise of the Holy Spirit at this part. There were, the, the Lord Jesus breathed on these disciples, these apostles, and they were also given instructions again at his ascension uh, that they were to go and to wait uh, at the upper room uh, and he would give them more instructions there. We find that they did go and believing that they needed to replace Judas they uh, in that period of time they had prayer but they also selected from two men uh, one who they thought would be the replacement for Judas but we found out in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 5 whenever Paul is giving the order of appearances to the Lord of after his resurrection that he includes at the very last that the last apostle almost born out of step out of time uh, that was with the others, and that was the Apostle Paul. Uh, and so it was not Matthias that they had selected who was to replace Judas. That
privilege was given to the Apostle Paul, and he was going to uh, be the uh, minister of the gospel of grace that was going to go throughout the world, uh, and the Lord had great things for him to do. So this is just that period of time in between uh, the Lord's resurrection and then whenever we have his ascension, which we will study for next week. I hope this has been helpful. Please know that we look forward to seeing you. We are here for you anytime. Uh, so we ask that you uh, let us know. Keep us in prayers and uh, let us hear from you. Let us know how your family uh, is. And we wish that you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving. We pray for God's blessings upon you. Thanks.